This week's Pearls of the Interior Life brings us back to the all-important R-word, relationship. Our big goal is happiness in this life and heaven in the next. To achieve this, we need to stay close to God throughout each day. But how do we do that while living in the real world with all of its challenges and distractions? Growing our interior life through Christian mental prayer is the answer. This podcast mines the riches of the greatest spiritual tradition on earth so we can grow in holiness together. I'm Steve Smith. Thank you for joining me for Pearls of the Interior Life. Welcome to this week's Pearls of the Interior Life. Thank you for making this time for the Lord. Always very good to be a part of that. This Sunday's Gospel in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34, is when the scribe asks Christ, what are the greatest commandments or what is the greatest commandment? And Christ responds, loving God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And the second one is like it, loving our neighbor as ourself. So we want to look at that and prepare ourselves for Sunday and then how we'll carry it through into the rest of the week in the follow-up emails that we send out for these things. But what we want to focus on is relationship, that all-important word for us, especially for our interior life. That's what we're focusing on here. How does this relate to our interior life from which everything else grows and flourishes? And there are three particular ways we want to look at that. Our relationship with God, of course, our relationship with our neighbor. And then we want to compare and contrast these two great commandments with how the world looks at it. So let's take those in turn again focusing on relationships so that first commandment brings us to love of god and as you said that the first great commandment love god with all your heart with all your mind with all your strength with, with all your soul and that plucky scribe he says to him you're you're right but he doesn't say in, in an arrogant way he's like oh I'm, I'm so much smarter than you I'm, jesus you're doing pretty good you're starting to think like i am no because otherwise christ wouldn't have at the end told him you're not far from the kingdom yeah the, the scribe was following along he felt affirmed jesus was probably there was some um disagreement amongst the scribes the pharisees others at the time of what what was the greatest commandment whether it was love of neighbor whether it was love of god and so uh, christ was affirming obviously what this scribe was thinking was the pronouncement of the law and when the scribe says it and words it back to him notice he uses a little bit different language he says you're right um master uh, God is one, and you should have no Lord, but Lord God. God is one. Now, the the early church fathers, and I think pretty much unanimously, people looking at the scripture, looking at the original language, take that, and then going back to the Old Testament, going back to Deuteronomy, other places where similar wording exists. God is one. It just means there is one God. But we also hear echoes in that. God is one of the Trinity. You know, God is three in one. And that's where we want to go with relationship uh, because God himself is relationship. That is in the nature of God. And remember, that's how we resemble God. And much more of this is in 30 days to Christian meditation. But we, we resemble God in our intellect and our will. God in his intellect, God's self-knowledge is, is that from which comes the Son. And then the love, the will, the will to love between Father and Son, that self-giving is from which proceeds the Holy Spirit. And that's where we resemble God. That's where we're meant particularly to enter into relationship with them. And that is what God desires. That's why Christ came down to restore that relationship so we could once again enter into the life of the Trinity. It is all about relationship for the umpteenth time. And we've looked at different um, approaches to that. Again, one of my old spiritual advisors would say, what do you do with someone when you're falling in love with them? You waste time with them. We need to waste time with God. Of course, that's never a waste. And we looked at this a little bit in the past, looking at leisure. 
at leisure, it's not just a, a passive, it, it's not a, a glass half empty, if we're, we're not doing something. No, leisure is very active. It's active stillness in the presence of God. But in, in advancing that relationship, again, so first and foremost, we do that in Christian meditation, spending that time in silence, especially in scripture, meditating on scripture where God reveals himself fully. And the fullness of public revelation is there in scripture and everything we need to know about God and how we're supposed to act relate to our neighbor is reflected there in scripture so we go there we meditate on these things we allow God to open our mind and our heart to what's there other practices practicing the presence of God from brother Lawrence always calling to mind during the day even right now at this very moment God is here all right God where are you what are you saying to me right now what are you calling me to every moment of the day and identifying those pearls. We talked about that before, those specific times in your life where God was so apparent to you, where you just had that consolation of the reality of God, not just reality of God, the reality of God's goodness, his very particular interest in you. We're meant to collect those pearls and we keep going back to them. We taste them again, as St. Ignatius would say. So relationship with God, we should have that on mind. We're seeing this when it says, love God it means first by building that relationship. That's how we love him best, drawing close to him, giving him the best of ourselves, the best of our time and our mind and our heart in meditation. And then everything else flows from there, which brings us to the second part of relationship. Our neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. And this has to follow from the first. It can't precede it. We can't just move straight to loving neighbor. It doesn't matter who it is or how much we might think we love them, whether it's our spouse or our children or a good friend, whoever it might be. We can't start with loving them. And why? <laughs> because we know why. Because we're just too darn selfish. We can't get out of our own way and our fallen nature. We have to love God first because loving our neighbor means desiring the highest and best thing for them. And often that uh, requires quite a bit of sacrifice on our part. Often it means desiring those highest and best things for people that we may not care for. It's easy to love the people that it's easy to love, but we're called to love everybody, everybody perfectly. And we can only do that once we start to have that assurance, that knowledge that there is an all powerful and all good and loving God who is watching out for us. And he's going to always make sure he's never outdone in generosity, right? He's always going to make sure that we're provided for so that we can pour ourselves out on others, even those people that it is difficult to love because it's not as if it, it's costing us anything. That's actually how we become fully ourselves, fully like God. That is why God came down to earth. He came and dwelt among us and gave us that example of a Christian life well lived, perfectly lived, a life of pouring yourself out for others. And then that becomes a life of blessing, a life of fulfillment. So love of neighbor and and that is all about relationship as well. And we, we touched on this quite a bit. We, I know we have in past videos and certainly quite a bit in 30 days of Christian meditation. It, there's only just so much of us to go around. We can't have 2000 Facebook friends or 200 or probably even 50. I mean, fine, we can shoot, shoot out little frivolous messages, but um, we are fooling ourselves if we think those are relationships. There is only a few people God puts before us at any given time that we can really pour ourselves out to and where we learn that depth of human relationship. Then, yes, we go out and we have all those other acquaintances and incidental relationships, just the random people God might put before us. But virtual relationships aren't <laughs> the two. It's, it's pretty much contradictory. There are a few people who we may from time to time um, extend our relationship through virtual means. But yeah, most of what passes as relationships through modern technology is is not isn't the real thing um, and and isn't God's design uh, for us. You know, relationships, they, they come and go and there's a time and a place for everything. Most relationships are meant 
to, to go their way as, as we move on in, in other phases in life. And we thank God for the time that we had with certain people. And then, you yeah, know, we go our separate ways. Three, what does the world say about all of this? Well, this is, of course, where Christianity really distinguishes itself, even from the other major world religions, especially when we look at Eastern mysticism. It, it does not understand this view of relationship. Um, much of, of the Zen view of things, life is about experiences. It's a very selfy thing. Even the idea of mm, dying to self, abnegation, emptying yourself, it, it's a very selfy version of emptying yourself. So what you can become Yes, in Christianity, the idea is for us to become saints, to become our true self, but always oriented towards the other, always oriented towards God and neighbor. Yeah, that's the great mystery there, that that's where we find ourselves in losing ourselves in the other. You're just not going to see that, especially now in secular society. And that's what we want to focus on for a moment, uh, whether you want to view it as Marcus, Marxist or, or socialist or atheist or secular you name it, uh, lives in, especially, let's focus on Marxism for a moment, because that's what's really influencing a lot of the cultural tides currently. And, and there is uh, an unacknowledged within Marxism schizophrenia there that, uh, as you said, the problem, we can't live out perfect society because we're fallen. We're just too darn selfish. And yet Marxism is based on the idea that we are essentially good and it's just a matter of getting that, that perfect engineering from the top down, the government that can design that perfect society that can provide for everybody because there is an understanding of the need for reciprocity, the balancing of, of rights and privileges, needs and duties between people. Their view is the only problem that we have is that there's just not enough stuff yet to go around. And, you know, we just got to get enough bread and circuses out there to keep everyone fed and entertained. And then life will be just fine. We're going to be able to engineer that utopia when we have the perfect government that can just, you know, move all the knobs and levers and get everyone producing just so not understanding and and deep down they do understand that we're fallen and that's never quite going to be good enough and that's why early on the state just has to you know rigidly take control of everything because it recognizes early on we're not capable of having that perfect selflessness but without the recognition that it's not just a matter of providing enough bread and circuses because it'll never be enough. There's always you know, that relative disparity of wealth is the real issue because we're always going to be prideful. We're always going to be vain. We're always going to be greedy. We're always going to be envious. So even if we have enough, if the person next to us has more, it's going to rub us the wrong way because they don't deserve that because they're not as wonderful as us. That's how I operate deep down other than, uh, other than God's grace. And Marxism or any other philosophy, never going to overcome that. But still, there's that feeling that if you have that top-down program, that's why in schools suddenly yeah, they want that authoritarian uh, approach in schools. Parents don't have any any role in schools. What do you know? We're, we know how to teach your children how to have the right form of reciprocity, how to get along and work within our brilliant system that's going to teach us how to love neighbor. And they want to get to the loving neighbor without loving God first. Good luck with that. So the world does not get this. And so in the world, there is always tension. There's always going to be between the haves and have nots, between rights and duties and privileges and so on. In the vision of man given by Christ, there is no tension. Everything is brought into harmony and completeness in those two great commandments, love of God, love of neighbor. By loving God first, we are able to perfectly love neighbor without tension. And this is obviously in the ideal. For example, God is both mercy and justice without tension. There is no mercy that is not just. There is no justice that is not merciful. St. Augustine, amongst many others, teaches that 
in God, both of these ultimately become one because they're they're united in love. It, it is this is why God is perfectly simple. You can't divide them up into these little itty bitty characteristics. You know, this part of God is mercy. This part of him is justice. Okay, now I'm now I'm getting his mercy. Now I'm getting his justice. Yes, we need that because we're finite and limited and linear. You know, we need piece by piece. This is why we're told in the Old Testament, God, he is completely beyond us. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts as high as the heaven is above the earth. As it, he does exist in that perfection of unity, of oneness, of simplicity, where all of this is just perfected in the bond of love. For us, it's, it's a process. We have to get there bit by bit, bit by bit, step by step. You know, what should we expect from our neighbor? What should we patiently bear in our neighbor? How are we called to respond in its, each situation? We have to grow into this. But ultimately, it is all simply stated in love God, love neighbor. Yes, we then need to see how does that play out in each new situation I'm brought to. And that is very complex for us. And that's why we were left a manual. It's called scripture. That's why we were left instructors. That's called the church to help us learn how to actually live that out in life. And it all, again, it always comes down to relationship. All of Christianity, all of working out our salvation, none of that happens in a vacuum. Every single iota of working out our salvation is in the context of relationship, relationship with God, relationship with neighbor. None of it is a solo affair, not one little bit of it. So when we hear that scripture again, the two great commandments, I, I would put to you in the first things that should always come to our mind is relationship. How am I working on the relationships in my life? How am I increasing, giving more of myself to God and then letting him lead me then in how I better love my neighbor? With that, I wish you a wonderful week ahead, working on the relationships within your life, deepening those, and I look forward to being with you again.